Thank you to our worship team for leading us in our time of praise and worship this morning. Well, our intercessory prayer text is once again 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Amen. Let me just uh, share with you this morning, um, I have been, well, I, we've been praying this particular, this has been our intercessory prayer text for, for a period of time, and, um, and this week it was really profoundly brought to my heart and my mind um, in fact, even as early as this morning, about 3 o'clock, I woke up with this verse, saying this verse. And, you know, we, are, we hear talk about renewal and revival and spiritual awakening. There's just a bit of a hum. Can you all hear it? Okay. Thanks. Um, there, it's gone. Um, but we're praying for, re you know, you hear people talking about renewal, revival, spiritual awakening, and, um, and, and those are all good, and we need those, and, and, and I'm praying in agreement for that. But what has really struck me, and the Spirit really just spoke to my heart, is that our expectation of or our anticipation, or our striving for renewal, for awakening, uh, or spiritual, you know, renewal and all that, we can't have that without repentance. See, I, you know, I can't be over here doing mess, and then move over here and say, God bless me. I got a big mess over there. I need to go over there and clean that up. In some way, repentance is that way of cleaning that up. And until we get to that point, I have to tell you that it, it just came to me that, that our prayer for renewal and revival and spiritual awakening really is repugnant to God. Because it's basically saying, well, we're going to do what we want to do, but we want you to, to bless us so we can all, you know, it's like kumbaya and be all, oh. But we want to continue. We can't do that. It doesn't work that way. Look at what the text says. If my people who are called by my name, and let me just, let, let me just clarify for this, this for you, who are called by my name, notice it doesn't say Southern Baptist. It doesn't say Presbyterian. It doesn't say Episcopalian. It doesn't say Assemblies of God. It says people who are called by my name. So if we are in the umbrella or the wide arching name of Christ as Christians, then this applies to us. Okay? This isn't my sermon this morning, by the way. But we are called by, or who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and get this one and turn from their wicked ways that is what we call repentance turning from our ways and we got we have to turn to a specific direct or in a specific direction so we're turning from our ways to Christ Jesus that's where we're turning we're not turning, you know, not turning around. We're not doing a 360 because if we do a 360, we're back where we started. Amen. We all know that. So you got to turn at least you got to do a 180, which turns you away from yourself and turns you to Christ. Then it says again that we that then, then it says, then will I hear from heaven will forgive their sin and will heal their land. There is a pathway, if you will, in this text. 
And you, we can't jump around it. We can't go around it. It's kind of like, I, I got this, this and, and hopefully I can explain this properly. You can put a smart car and an Indy 500 car side by side. And you can be a skilled driver. But unless, unless you're on the road with tires and all of the things that go with it, you can't go anywhere with that car. Be it a smart car or an Indy 500 car. Now, the difference is smart car, you know, you know smart cars, those little things. And then, you know, an Indy car is expensive. I mean, millions of dollars go into Indy cars. But, and no matter how skilled you are at driving, you can't go anywhere with either one of them without tires, wheels, and fuel. no matter how good you are. And here in this text, if we're not God's people, if we're not under the umbrella of having a relationship with him, be it whatever denomination you want to make it, if we're not humbling ourselves, if we're not praying, if we're not seeking his face, if we're not turning from, his, from our ways to him, then our expectation to hear from heaven, to be, given of our sin, be forgiven of our sins, and to have our land healed, <clears throat> we're fooling ourselves. And so, um, this profoundly came to me this week. We cannot, we cannot expect God to bless us when we're wallowing in our mess. When we're wallowing in our own um, divisiveness in our own choices of what it is, what it means to be a child of God. He already outlines it. We're under his name. We're called by his name. We're humble. We're prayerful. We seek his face. And we're not doing our own thing when we do that. And so this morning, our prayer request is for our, our specific intercessory emphasis is for God's people. We want to remember, we'll remember the families that are dealing with grief in our fellowship and, and those who are dealing with health issues. Um, but we really need to get a hold of this idea of trying to do our own thing and expecting God to bless us. Let's pray to God. Creator God, our Heavenly Father, thank you that you are faithful to fulfill all your promises. You have said that you dwell in the hearts of your people through the presence of the Holy Spirit. We, your church, gathered here together. When we gather, Lord, you said you are in the midst of us. So humbly, Father, we ask that you would hear our prayer. That you would strengthen your church. Lord, you are the God of peace. And we pray that you would sanctify us completely. May our whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have called us and you will be faithful to the end. Father, we pray that you would be with the families that are part of our fellowship who are experiencing grief. We pray for the Denny family, the Darling family, the McGlendon family. And Lord, we pray for those who are dealing with health issues. We thank you for touching our bodies and, our, and restoring physical health to, to those, Lord, that you've restored health to. 
Father, I also pray that you would continually lift us up in terms of our finances. We thank you for the blessings that you have bestowed upon us and where we are today, financially, not only individually, but as a fellowship. We pray, God, that you would continue to bless us. And Lord, we, we don't want our actions to be repugnant to you. Lord, we know that we have stumbled and we have fallen and we have transgressed your word and we have sinned. And Lord, we literally have done things that we shouldn't have done. And then we have neglected to do the things that you have told us to do. And so, Lord, we turn from our wicked ways and turn to you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for salvation. Thank you for going to the cross because as you went to the cross and as you suffered and died, you redeemed us so that when the Father looks at us, he sees us as clean. And so, Lord, today, we just thank you for the privilege of prayer. I humbly come, Father, asking that you would think with my mind and speak with my voice. I stand in obedience to the call that you have placed upon my life. And I ask you to use me today as your instrument. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord. And may your word, yes, Lord, your word, may it accomplish fully what you would have it to accomplish today. For it's in the name of Jesus that I pray, with joy, thanksgiving, and forgiveness of sin. Amen. Turn with me, if you will, to uh, Colossians chapter 4. And uh, we're going to be looking at verses 2 through 6. It's interesting that Paul, though he was a prisoner in Rome, it didn't stop him from bearing witness for Christ. And even in chains... He was about changing people's lives. He tells the believers, really in our text, he tells the believers how to effectively witness for Christ. And you may not believe it, but there are opportunities before us every day to change lives. And today what we're going to look at, we're going to look at Paul's instructions to the church at Colossae on how they can accomplish the task of being a witness for Jesus. The title of today's message is Proclaiming Opportunities. Proclaiming Opportunities. There are or opportunities that we have to proclaim, and there's a message that we are called to proclaim. But if you have your Bible open, if you turn with me, and if you're with me, I'm going to begin at verse 2. And reading from the New International Version, it says, Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly, as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. Well, four things that Paul instructs the church at Colossae to do. 
And if we really think about it, and, and, and I'll give you the four things. Let me give you the four things before I get too excited and too carried away and, 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 and forget to tell you. Number one is prayer. Number two is preparation. Number three is presentation. And number four is the pronouncement. Prayer, preparation, presentation, pronouncement. In verse 2, he says right off the bat, Paul says to them, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And then in verse 3, he says, and pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message. So Paul, first of all, in prayer, says to them that before you speak, before you have the opportunity to proclaim any message, know that you have to pray. And he says, first of all, pray for yourselves. Remember when the apostles were with Jesus in the garden before he was arrested, and he said to them, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. And then he said something that, that really I think Paul is trying to, to, to reiterate to the church at Colossae. He says, the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. We have to remember that when, we're, when we talk about praying for, or more, we're praying for ourselves. We, we, we tend to, you, you've heard people say that, that when they, they, they get down at the end of the night and they're kneeling at the side of their bed and they begin to pray and then you hear them say, and then I fell asleep and, and woke up a little bit later and there I was on my knees at the side of my bed. What a spiritual experience. No! You're being lazy. Watch and pray. Don't snooze and pray. <laughs> Don't nap and pray. We are to watch and pray. In fact, in the Old Testament, when Nehemiah was, when was about to rebuild the wall and, and, the, and the nation got together and, and they started to rebuild the wall, what did they do? They, they started a prayer meeting and they set up a watch. Because if we're not praying and watching, what will happen is we will succumb to the wheels of the, or the wilds of the world. And, and we'll, we'll be tempted by Satan because we're, we're into this spiritual fog that, we, that we're kind of pretending is righteousness. And the reality is that we're just being lazy. But Paul says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And we're going to get to thankful in a little bit. But I, I want to make sure that we understand that, that we're, we're, we're watching. In fact, a, a great example, New Testament example of Paul watching in prayer is when the, the Philippian jailer. Paul was praying, right? And that the story goes, he was praying, and, and then this, this man, he, he's about to harm himself. How would Paul have been able to see that the jailer was going to harm himself if his eyes had not been open? Amen? Amen. So here he's, he's saying, we need to watch and pray. And our Lord said, watch and pray. Well, Paul not only says to them, pray for themselves, but then he tells them, to pray for him as well. As he told, as we talked about last week when we were in Ephesians chapter 6, it says, pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. Paul said, I am so concerned about what it is I'm going to say. Please pray for me so that when my mouth opens, I will say what is Good and say the message that comes out of me will be clear. And then I'll say it with boldness, fearlessly. 
So Paul says we need to be, or he's asking for prayer and, it, and reminding us that, that the steps of our, our proclaiming opportunities begins with prayer. Doesn't begin when we go out the door, but it begins before we go out the door. Well, then he also talks specifically about some preparation. And the preparation is really, in this part, he's dealing with where you are to speak. Look, listen to what he says in verse 3 again. He says, and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. We need to, as we prepare for where we are to speak, we need to be watchful for the open door. As I said Paul had opportunities. Here he is in prison, and he's speaking to the church. He's writing this letter to the church to remind them that they have opportunities. This week, I was sharing with, with Evelyn and Dania on Thursday about an opportunity that I had that a gentleman from one of the stores that we pick up from, he, he made the comment that I must have been a Christian. And I'm thinking, well, you know, you know, I'm driving a big orange van that says on the side, you know, operated by Meridian Baptist Church, but he never saw that part. And this is after he had told me about the, the negatives of ex his negative experience with some other church folks from another church. And I'm like, oh, wow. And, you know, I just kind of. And then he says, so wh where's your organization? And I said, well, Meridian Baptist Church. He says, oh, you're a Christian? I said, yeah. He says, I thought so. But let me tell you why he said he thought so. Well, it was one thing about the way we pick up, you know, we just pick up everything and then we come and sort it and throw it in the dumpster or whatever here. But he says, I saw you picking up trash in our parking lot. See, we need to be watchful for the open door. In fact, Paul told the church at Corinth, he says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. In other words, we're going to have opportunities. And we have opportunities. And we are going to be held accountable for what we've done with those opportunities, good or bad. So they're going to be there. They are there. We have woken up this morning on this side of glory. So there is an opportunity before all of us to share the gospel today. Well, not only does he say be watchful. He says be clear about the opportunities. Again, saying to, speaking to the church at Corinth, he says, therefore, since... Through God's mercy, we have this ministry. We do not lose heart. You say, what ministry is that? Well, it's the ministry of reconciliation. And let me read that same passage in, in the Amplified Version. I think you'll get the understanding now. It says, therefore, since we have this ministry, just as we receive mercy from God, granting us salvation, opportunities, and blessings... We do not get discouraged nor lose our motivation. So we're a part of our preparation is that we're not only looking for the open door, but we're also looking for those opportunities that he's given us, those specific opportunities. But Paul goes even further when he says, if we look down with me at verse, getting into verse 5, he says, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders we ought to make a note there underline that one we need to be aware of our audience as we're preparing think about it. you know we, we talk about and I know we joke sometimes we talk about terms like sanctification justification trans whatever or we talk about hermeneutics or exegesis and, and 
Yeah, see, some of the looks that I'm getting right now, those doesn't make you like, what is he talking about? He's talking some foreign language. We need to be aware of our audience. Listen to what Paul said to the church, again, at Corinth. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law. Now, before we get too far, Paul isn't saying, hey, I'm going to go out and do everything I want to do. He's still under the law of Christ. He knows that his behavior is still under his commitment to Jesus. He can't go out, in other words, he can't go out on Friday and party and hang out and do all kind of wild stuff, dance on tables, and then come in on Sunday morning saying, oh, Lord, bless me. Doesn't work that way. Just like I talked about repentance earlier, it doesn't work that way. We can't be two separate people. Paul's saying, no, that's not the case. And then he goes on to explain it as he's talking to the church at Corinth. He says, so as to win those not having the law. Then he goes on to say, to the weak I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all men so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all of this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. So in other words, we have to learn and be aware of our audience and communicate to our audience. We don't talk to someone who is in the, you know, you don't talk to someone, or even a child, you don't talk to a, a kindergartner the way you talk to a senior in high school. Well, I mean, sometimes, but I mean, <laughs> What a bad, but you, you get what I'm saying. We have to be aware of our audience. And, and we know that, that as we are, we're preparing, that's part of our preparation. You have to know where you're going to go. You're not going to, you know, you're not going to sit there in the grocery store and, and go through the Romans road with the cashier with five people in line behind you. Amen? You're gonna, that's going to ruin your witness and it's going to make everybody mad. And, and that's not, that's not you've got to be aware of your audience. Amen? But then he goes on to talk about not only are we going to be prayerful and not only are we going to be prepared, but he also talks about the presentation. Look at what he says. Again, looking at verse 5. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. There is, when we are presenting the gospel, there is verbal and nonverbal. For example, if someone is talking to you, or you're talking to someone and you're excited about information you want to share, and then all of a sudden, they pull out their cell phone and start doing this. What's, what goes through your mind? Besides how rude they are and all that kind of stuff, you get upset and you're saying, well, my message isn't important to them. But reverse the roles for a moment. What if a person desperately wants to know about Jesus and they come to you and you take out your cell phone and start texting. What are you saying to them? They're not important. And Paul says specifically, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Who are the outsiders? Those people who do not know Jesus. And not only do they not know Jesus, but because they don't know Jesus, they are people without hope. And for us to say to someone who was without hope, I don't care about you. I don't want to listen to you. I want to do my own thing. You're, you're really kind of bothering me is what we're saying. And Paul's saying, we cannot do that. One of my favorite sayings is a saying that's attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. that says, preach often and if necessary, use words. We ought to preach by our 
lifestyle, by who it is. As I said, this gentleman from the grocery store, he says, you know, I, I kind of thought you were a Christian. It's because the way you, you know, I, I go in the store, hey, hey, how's it going? You know, I go see him. And I even said to him, well, Joseph, that's a good name. And he, and, and he ended up sharing with me that, you know, I am a Christian. I said, well, that's great. And then, you know, in our discussion, he wanted to know, where's, where's, where's Meridian Church at? And, you know, I, I told him where it was. I told him, you know, we're on the corner of Washington, South 3rd, and El Cajon. He's going, oh, and, you know, the, the funny thing, I don't know if you all do this. I, I, I use this as kind of a tool. People always kind of like, Washington, South 3rd. And I go, y'all know where Outback Steakhouse is? <laughs> and people go, oh, yeah. I go, we're diagonally across the street. If you can find Outback Steakhouse, you can find Meridian. <laughs> and they're like, oh. I go, oh, yeah. And on a good day, when, the, when Wendy's is smoking French fries or dipping French fries and they're grilling steaks over there, you can stand out and you can gain 15 pounds in our parking lot. And they're like, oh, but you know what? It causes people to think, oh, wow. Oh, yeah, I know where the Wendy's is. I know where the Outback. Oh, oh, I go, yeah, you know that Arco station, it looks like it has a steeple on it? That's really our steeple behind the Arco station. Our presentation needs to be not only verbal, but nonverbal. But it also needs to be full of grace. And you're probably thinking, well, what, Pastor, what do you mean by full of grace? Well, you know, occasionally you'll come across somebody that just doesn't understand and you just have to tell them, stop doing what you're doing and turn your life around because you're going to hell. But that's generally not the presentation of the gospel that you use. Usually we, we talk to people, find out a little bit about them, a little bit about what, what they believe in their life. Before, we, you know, we don't just walk up to people and say, you know, Turn or burn. We don't do that. There needs to, our, our presentation of the gospel needs to be full of grace. Understanding, and, and the best way to understand grace is to think about where we were before we came to know Jesus as Savior and Lord. Think about ourselves. Well, then he not only says it should be Full of grace, down in verse 6. He says, let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt. Now, just so you know, it's not a salty conversation. <laughs> it's seasoned with salt. Understanding that salt in biblical times was equivalent to purification. It was used not just to, to, to season, but to Store and to restore the flavor and to preserve. That's what it was used for. And so he's talking about here that not only is our conversation supposed to be full of grace and season, but he's really saying that we're, our conversation needs to have sound doctrine. In fact, he said to Timothy, he says, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. There's a reason why it needs to be seasoned with salt. And he also earlier had said to the, this same church that, that, that their conversation needed to be really seasoned with wisdom. We said, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual psalms with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. There it is again. Words or deeds. We're doing it. For the glory of God, not for ourselves, not to bring attention to ourselves. And so that, that really kind of begins to show us that, that this idea of proclaiming the gospel, these proclaiming opportunities, it begins with prayer. 
And we know that we've got to be prepared in our minds and our hearts. We go out to make this presentation. And then you might be asking, and I hope you are, what's the presentation? That's the simplest part of this whole text. He says, back up in verse 3. He says, pray, and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ. That's our pronouncement, if you will. The mystery of Christ. And in fact, he said, he had earlier said to the church here, he says, my purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, comma, namely Christ. They need to know Jesus as their Savior. That's the message. That's the proclamation. That's what we pronounce to people, that Jesus is the Messiah. That yes, he came, but he is coming again for his church. Well, why do we do this? I'm so glad you asked. Look at the very, look at the very end, from the bottom of my page, the end of verse 6. He says, let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Why do we speak? Why, do we why are we given these proclaiming opportunities so that we'll share the gospel message to everyone we meet? I'm going to go to 1 Peter. Peter he, he really explains it, I think, a little better than, than Paul. But he says, but in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. He's saying, you do a good job and, and you present the gospel and don't you worry about the outcome. My father's going to take care of the outcome. God's going to take care of the outcome. You and I can't save anyone. We can't make anyone grow in their faith. But God will do that. But let me just share this. We have to be willing to get out of the way and let him do that. Now, I, I don't mean no harm, but... Sometimes folks get the idea that, that we get, you know, a little bit of Bible knowledge and we become experts in the Bible. And we know everything. But we don't. We don't. The best thing that we can do is we can show people how to discover the answer for themselves. And grow. Well, two, two, two final things. And... I, I, I know that, um, let me get my contacts focused. Okay, we got, pl we got plenty of time. It's not, uh, our, our church council is until 1230. It's just 1135. Two things to go along with all of this that Paul shares. As I said earlier, we need to be watchful. Prayer is not a spiritual luxury. It's a spiritual necessity. Just like you and I need air to breathe, we need prayer to breathe, to live, to have a vibrant faith. If we don't pray, we're, we're basically saying, Lord, I don't need you. I got this on my own. I can do this. I don't need to check in with you. But Paul said something very interesting. He said to the church at Thessalonica, he said, pray continually. And when he talks about being watchful, he's talking about being alert and aware. Not, again, not dozing off and not being drowsy because then we could, again, fall into temptation in the world. 
Jesus said, Therefore keep watch, because you don't know on what day your Lord will come. We need to be always ready. And in fact, Paul said in Acts chapter 20, he says, So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you, or each of you, night and day with tears. And then he says, again, to the church at Corinth, he says, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be men of courage, be strong, do everything in love. Then he said, so then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. But not only are we to be watchful, we're to be thankful. Think about it for a moment. When we pray to our Heavenly Father, we are literally speaking with the one who created the world, who spoke it into existence. What? What right do we have to come to him, to speak to him? See, prayer ought to be, well, prayer is connected to thankfulness. We ought to be thankful for the opportunity. In fact, Paul said, don't be anxious for anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with what? Thanksgiving, present your request to God. God, I'm thankful I can bring this opportunity to you, bring this request to you, because I got this problem, and I'm bringing it to you, and I'm leaving it at your feet, and I'm walking away. Because it's bigger than, than me, and you can handle it. Because you are God. And when we approach prayer with a thankful heart, it gives us the proper attitude before God. Who are we to talk to God and like, you know, like he's our buddy or our pal? He's God. So Paul is saying this, saying this to the church at Colossae. And again, remember, he's in prison and he's writing to them and he's encouraging them to be prepared for the opportunity that's going to come to them to witness. The opportunity that he's seizing and sharing with them. We need to be prayerful. We need to be prepared. We need to know the presentation. And see, we can't know the presentation. You can't do the pronouncement. You can't pronounce Christ as Savior and Lord Unless you know him as Savior and Lord. Because you can't talk about something you don't know. Well, you can talk about it, but it, it has no authority. It has no, no, no power, no strength. Because you're just talking about head knowledge. What Paul's talking about, he's talking about your heart knowledge of Christ. Being able to share what Christ has done for you. When you're, when you're able to do that, that's the opportunities that God, he literally puts before us every day that we wake up on this side of glory. We have an opportunity to share. But if we don't know him, it's, you know, it's like having that car, that smart car, that Indy car but you don't know how to drive. Never sat behind a wheel. Don't know what the gas pedal looks like. Don't know what a brake pedal looks like. And really don't know anything about what to do. Someone tells you, get in and drive. And you go, I don't know. Or even worse, you get in on the wrong side. Our 
Our, pro our proclaiming opportunities are before us. If we'll seize the opportunity. If we'll grab a hold of it. If we'll be prayerful, prepared, know how to present the gospel and make the pronouncement that Jesus Christ is Lord. That he's come to save that and those who are lost. I was once one of them. But then I opened my heart and I asked Jesus to come into my life and to be my savior. And forever I have been changed. That is the opportunity that is before all of us today. My prayer is that what's been said today will resonate in your heart. That it'll make that transfer from your head to your heart. And that your life will be changed today. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you. I thank you, Lord, for today and the opportunity of today. A day that we've never seen before and we'll never see again. God, I pray that your word, as I said, will not return unto you a void, but will accomplish what you'd have it to accomplish. Christ Jesus, you came from heaven to earth. You suffered and died on the cross at Calvary. Your body was taken off of the cross and placed in a tomb. And the stone was rolled in front of the tomb. But on the third day, as you promised, you got up. And when the stone was rolled away, the tomb was empty. And later you appeared to your apostles. And as you promised, you ascended into heaven and sent the Holy Spirit to guide and comfort us. To guide and even comfort, and to comfort them in particular. And you do that today with us as we profess our faith in you. Lord, when we admit that we need you in our lives. That we're outside of the ark of safety. That your blood, that your shed blood has created for us. Lord, we individually have to ask ourselves, individually ask, where are we with you? Paul could proclaim you even in chains because he knew he knew that you were his Savior and Lord. So I pray today, Lord, that we would each here in this room or those who are watching through the live stream or will watch this video later, I pray that we'll come to that point in our lives when we know for certain We've opened our hearts and invite you to come in to be our Savior and Lord. Lord, I pray that you'd have your way with each and every one of us. For it's in your name that I pray with joy thanksgiving and forgiveness of sin.
Let's stand together. I know that your giving to the California Missions Offering goes a long ways. And I've seen uh, the money that you give help churches to, to reach children and have them hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. I, I've seen your money go out to the migrant fields, to migrant workers and, and feed them and clothe them. And I've seen the gospel be, be shared by, by these very same people from the churches that we help. See, these churches, Many of them would not be able to do this ministry if it wasn't for the money that you give. And so I thank you for giving sacrificially. It is just such a blessing to know that as a family here in California of SBC churches, we can make a difference when we give. And so I want to say thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for giving to the California Missions Offering. God bless you.